praise God for God's good work and great things he has done. He's done great things. Amen. Amen. It's good we can stir the place. No matter where we are, good to see you. No matter what we're going through, we can tell God it's well with my soul. God, I trust you enough. I trust you enough. Hallelujah. And pray that you all participate in the worship. Elder Boyd doing such a good job shepherding our youth. Amen. So many, amen, amen. Amen. All of those who participated in Amen yesterday, would you just stand, please, just for a moment? We just give you a shout out. Come on now, don't be shy. Amen. Amen, 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 amen. amen. Go ahead and stand there. You guys stand there now. Keep on calling now. Keep on calling. Amen. Amen, amen. Hallelujah. We praise God for your leaders. I especially want to thank the G14. They walk through some church administration processes, the ministries being effective and efficient. It is a great joy. For those of you who weren't able to make it, much of it is on video, and so we can email it to you. If you give us your email, we'll gladly tell you and show you what happened on yesterday. It, it's a great thing. Amen. For those of you who have participated in bringing water to send to the people of Flint, praise God. I called several churches out of Flint. I remember the first time I called, I said, excuse me, I'm calling from Charlottesville, Virginia. Where is that? That's in Charlottesville, Virginia. It's right there. But we want to we wanna bring water to the people of, of Flint. Do you still need it? And with some interesting tone, a woman said to me, why wouldn't we need water? And uh, that was wonderful because it reminded me how urgent the need is for the people of Flint. Go home and turn your water off. I dare you go to 48 hours without turning it on again for a bath, for a cup of coffee, for anything, and see what happens. So it's a wonderful joy that we get to bless the people of Flint. We already have a couple drivers who we will be driving together. We had planned to drive my vehicles, which is a 15-passenger, a small 15-passenger, but still 15-passenger, but, but nonetheless. But we'll probably have to get a U-Haul because we're just collecting at a great rate. Great rate. We're excited because UVA, amen, UVA, Black Voices will be singing here today at 3 p.m. Would you say that 3 p.m.? 3 p.m. Now, I know you've got a full and busy schedule, but it would be wonderful for us to show out and show up to support UVA Black Voices. They have a great ministry, and I'll tell you, they didn't say it, I'll say it. Their practices, they always fast before they have a concert. Amen, because they do it as a form of ministry. So I want to encourage you and challenge you to fill your car, put somebody in your trunk, Bring them here so they can be part of this concert. Amen? Amen. Amen. Praise God. Let's stand to our feet for the reading of the word. Amen. This is a wonderful series, Try Love. Wonderful, wonderful series, Try Love. It deals with the reality that love can be hurtful, harmful at times, but we ought not quit. We ought to try again. God always has something better in our future. You got that? Amen. God always has something better in our future. Amen. If you have your bulletin. Please take the time to read it. I'm going to ask that you turn, if you don't, to Ruth chapter 3, beginning at verse 10 through 18. Ruth, Pentum of Judges. Ruth chapter 3. And I'll begin reading from the NIV at verse 10. And it reads like this. The Lord bless you, my daughter, he replied. This kindness is greater than that which you showed earlier. You have not run after the younger brother, whether rich or poor. And now, my daughter, don't be afraid. I will do for you all you ask. All the people of my town know that you are a woman of noble character. Although it is true that I am a guardian redeemer of our family, there is another who is more closely related than I. Stay here for the night, and in the morning, if he wants to do his duty as your guardian redeemer, good. Let him redeem you. But if he is not willing as surely as the Lord lives, I will do it. Lie here until morning. 
So she lay at his feet until morning, but got out before anyone could be recognized, and he said, no one must know that a woman came to the threshing floor. He also said, bring me the shawl you are wearing and hold it out. When she did so, he poured into it six measures of barley and placed the bundle on her. Then he went back to town. When Ruth came to her mother-in-law, Naomi asked, how did it go, my daughter? Then she told her everything Boaz had done for her and added, he gave me these six measures of barley saying, don't go back to your mother-in-law empty handed. Then Naomi said, wait, my daughter, until you find out what happens. For the man will not rest until the matter, matter is settled. Uh, for a few moments, I need your help. I, come on, I need your help to get it. You got to find five people and just tell them when a man loves a woman. Come on, there's five people today. You got to stretch. I know it's a stretch. When a man loves a woman. When a man loves a woman. And some of you sat down, so I don't know how you got five. You got to move now. You got to move. Get your move on. Amen. Amen. When a man loves a woman. Oh God, we thank you for the sweet spirit of joy, laughter, and love that you give your people. You graciously give us so much. You give us endless strength, peace, and hope, and joy, God. You forgive us time in and time out. God, we thank you now for your rich word, God. Would you allow our hearts to supernaturally connect to your word in such a way that it might work on us and in us. God, issue a warrant for our arrest so our attention might be focused and fixed on you, God. We thank you for your word in advance. Solo be your Gloria. In Jesus' name we pray as people of God. Say amen, amen. and praise amen. God. If there is any miracle that God allows you and me to make, it is the miracle of love. If there is any miracle that God allows mankind to make, it is the miracle of love. God in his supernatural grace has given us the capacity to love just like him. Think about it. All the things we cannot do, we may not be able to create heavens, we may not be able to create the oceans, we may not be able to do so much, but one thing that we can do, just like God, is we can love. And I've come by to tell you that is the miracle that God allows us to make. God allows us to make love. God, God allows us to make love in our family. God allows us to make love in our community. God allows us to make love in our church. God says, oh, y'all can feel me, where, where there's bitterness, where there's strife, where there's confusion, where there's anger, God says you and I can step in and turn it into love. God says we indeed can make love there. Okay, y'all not feel me. Uh, if you consider uh, the, 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 the politicians and uh, those who are running for office and what they like to say and how they like to say it, it's this time that we need to step in and show love is greater than fear. Love is greater than hate. I, I know it sounds powerful and bold and audacious to talk about going to war and getting them and banning them and attacking them, but the danger is folk die when you go to war. So the next time you watch the politicians and they talk about all of this hard and harsh talk, remind them, remind yourself, and remember that when we went to Afghanistan, we lost 3,000 American soldiers. Some say 1,500, but that does not count the contractors. You didn't know that you get this on Sunday morning. But the truth is, we need to be reminded that where there is a lack of love, there is a presence of hurt, harm, and death. We need, okay, I said 
said 3,000, that is double all of the faculty at UVA. So if you know any faculty members at UVA, just imagine doubling all of the faculty members at UVA and then imagine they no longer exist. That's what happens when we have war where there should be love. And not just on a state or government or country level or world level, but in our homes and in our hearts. Where there is an absence of love, there'll be hurt, harm, and death. So this text is a wonderful teaching text because it reminds you and me that we have the capacity, we have the ability, we have the opportunity, we have the gift to turn hateful things, harmful things, and even dead things into loving things. And we can walk into places and show love. Y'all not going to me, so I'll make a plan. I went to the auto parts store. I never go there, but I went to the auto parts store, and, and Cam Newton had just lost, uh, just lost, he lost Van. So I was going down the aisle, and I heard two dudes talking real mean. Uh, they didn't look like me. They were talking real mean. Yeah, we glad he lost. That, that boy was out of his place. We glad he went down like that. We glad, we glad, and they wanted me to respond. So you know what I did? I did respond. I said, I'm so glad he lost two guys. Yeah, all right. And I walked on by because where there is conflict, where there is confusion, where there is ruckus, God says we can step in and show love. This is the picture of a brother named Boaz. Boaz was a brother who knew how to make love. Boaz was a brother who knew how to love. Boaz was a brother who knew what love was. Please be reminded, if you weren't here last week, that Ruth and Naomi were in a treacherous situation. But the thing I did not tell you about Ruth and Naomi being both widows, not only were they in a treacherous financial place, but they even were, in a sense, cursed by the world. Did you know that widows in that day had to wear what was called the widow garment? So they walked around, and everybody who saw them recognized that they had been stricken with death, that they had lost the one who loved them and the one who was taking care of them, the one who was covering them, and now they were uncovered. Everywhere they went, they had to stand out and look out, and people had to look at them. And yet we find Ruth in a wonderful scene with somehow sustaining and maintaining her joy. I told you last week she maintained her joy because she understands sisterhood or friendship. I told you last week that she maintained her joy because she was free from stain. She refused to get bitter. You need to tell your neighbor that. Refused to get bitter, whatever the circumstance. And I also told you that, that she had a focused stride, that she was willing to do the work that God had given her to do. Even though it was difficult, she did that thing. And, and so now we find not a focus on Ruth, but a focus on Boaz. Boaz is a bad brother. Boaz is a bad brother because he is noted for one thing. You ready? He is noted for his character. Uh, Y'all ain't shot, shot right there. That's okay. Uh, he, he's not noted for his wealth. He, he's not um, noted for his education, his intellect. He, he's not noted for, for fame, but he is famed for his character. In fact, the word noble means heavy character, that he has a great deal of character. And I know why this isn't hitting you like you need to get it, because uh, you forgot we're talking about relationships. And is as a matter of relationship, let me tell you what matters most. Are you ready? Uh, are you ready? Character. The, the most important thing about your baby boo, the most important thing about that handsome brother, about that fine sister, uh, uh, not her lips, uh, hips, or fingertips, uh, the most important thing is the character. Because, okay, y'all have done. Uh, uh, dubbed, dubbed it in, in 2002, April of 2013. Dove did a wonderful special where they would have people uh, interview are being interviewed by an artist. This was a special artist, and the artist was not allowed to see them. You had to describe yourself to the artist, and the artist would draw a picture. Yeah, the artist would draw a picture. Now, now they did not know that somebody else had already described you to the artist. So when they rendered the picture, the picture that had been described by the individual was always less attractive than the picture that had been rendered by somebody else. Because the other could see the true beauty on the inside. 
And so I've come by to tell you, while we focus on beauty on the outside, the truth is beauty on the outside is not the issue. Come by to tell y'all, all oh, y'all look good. I mean, uh, beauty on the outside. Did you know the beauty industry is a $94 billion industry for hair, nails, skin, and makeup, even brothers, even cologne and perfume, $94 billion. Uh, beauty is not the issue. Y'all look beautiful, wonderful, handsome. Y'all look good. I'm comfortable with my masculinity. Y'all look real good. I'm just saying. And that's not the issue. The issue is a character issue. And Boaz brings forth the issue of character. Now, let me show you in the text uh, why his character stands out and stands above all the others. Uh, first, we see in his character that, that he had the capacity for appreciation and admiration. Would you say that appreciation and admiration? Now, I know when you go on a date, first thing you do is look at clothes, look at the car, you know, want to see what he has going on. You listen for things like, you know, career, job. But, but I come by to tell you, you want to know this. Does the brother have a capacity for appreciation and admiration? I'm in the text. Check it out. He says to Ruth, thank you for choosing me. Y'all missing that word. Why do you hear so much? Let me break down. He is the guardian redeemer. He is the kinsman redeemer. He is the man. In the man. And his response is, thank you for giving me an opportunity. Uh, she was in a place of desperation. She was in a place of need. He had all he needed. He was on top. He could have said, yeah, I am the kid of the redeemer. Yeah, I got my stuff together. Yeah, I look good. Yeah, you found me, baby girl. Yeah, it's all good now. But his humility, his humility allowed him to appreciate her. Now, the truth is, because you do not meet the person you're dating for the first six months, don't focus on if they appreciate you. Focus on their capacity to appreciate. Okay, so I'm going to help you take this book. Because if, if they have the ability to appreciate, you'll notice they'll, they'll go to the restaurant. I, I'm just, I had to say this. Our first day was out. I helped, you know, I helped him with stuff and the hang here and stuff. Carl over there, I was I helped him with me, he wasn't talking. Uh, but, but we had a good, I'm sorry, Jimmy, thank you, baby. But we had a good time. <laughs> The chicken was hard and old. <laughs> now, if she would have said, you know what? I expected some French cuisine. I expected some ribs. I expected a little something better because I'm better. At that point, you know what I would have said? I can't afford you. You don't appreciate me. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. People who have the capacity to appreciate are the kind of people you want to be around. Yeah. People who are naturally grateful, God help me, are the kind of people that we enjoy. You know, I, I had the privilege of pastoring for five years here, and I just want to say thank you. I want to say thank you because you are a wonderful congregation. You're the best congregation in Charlottesville, Virginia, and possibly the world. You are wonderful people. I am grateful that you give me the opportunity to participate in relationships Sunday after Sunday and dance day. Thank you very much. Uh, appreciation goes a long way. If you want to be in a healthy relationship, find someone who has the capacity, the tendency, the practice of appreciating. Now, if the brother complains about his job, complains about his parents, complains about his self, complains about his dog, complains about his shoes, and if there's a whole lot of complaining, let them go. Yeah. Because they cannot be satisfied. Somebody's complaining right now. They cannot be satisfied. Complaining is a sign of a spiritual sickness. In fact, throughout the Bible, complainers are often killed by God. Convictions run around, but all around here. Uh, complaining 
is not from God. People who are appreciative are the kind of people that you will gravitate to and appreciate. God says, if you want to be in a healthy relationship, he appreciated her. In, in, in every standard rule or law, it should have been the other way around. He should have been expecting appreciation but, and celebration, but instead he appreciated her. That's important. Notice people who are appreciative. Those are the kind of people Amen. you want to, but, but not only appreciation, but admiration. You say, Reverend, the same thing. You, you, you're almost right there close, but they're different. Appreciation is horizontal. Admiration is vertical. Admiration uh, comes from the Latin French. It means to admire or to see as a miracle. I'm on the word. <laughs> when she and when he saw her, he said in his heart, oh my God, this is a miracle. God made this thing happen. God brought you into my presence. God gave me you. And when you know someone who looks to God and can see the gifts that God has given, they're worshipful, that is a powerful person. Because, check it out, God works in the kind of way when you admire what he's given you, God says, I got to give you more. Amen. Okay, God, I'm telling you, I got to move on. Uh, we were at the, the bike store for my boys. We were at the bike store for my boys. Got one tire fixed, got the other the paddles. But my little girl, she was there too. She said, well, you know, Daddy, I don't have a bike. She said, can I have a bike for my birthday? I said, cool in the game. You can have a bike for your birthday. She said, she said, oh, thank you, Daddy. Thank you. She was so sweet. I said, you know what? I like that. So I went and got her a bell. I got her a bell for the bike that we would get it for her birthday. It was a wonderful bell, a little pink bell. But on the way out, she was so appreciative of this bell. Oh, my bell. I got a, she doesn't have a bike. I got a bell. I got a bell. I got a bell. Look what I got, a bell. On the way out, there was a little pink bike to the right. And, and, and because she was so appreciative uh, of the bell, I asked the man, I said, sir, how much is this pink bike? Because she's got a pink bell. Maybe I can put on a leg. I don't know. Maybe, maybe I come back real soon. I don't know. Brother Crosby. And, and I said, uh, how much is the bike? And check this out. The man said to me, y'all listen. He said, I'll give it to you for $25. Mm. Bing, bing. We were out with the bike. And the, the way God works in your life, in my life, is he responds to admiration. He responds to a heart of appreciation. When you make it your habit in relationship with him, in relationship with others, to appreciate what you have, Grandma said, Mama said, thanks makes room for more. Thank you, God, for being so good. Thank you, baby, for looking out for me. Thank you for being so wonderful. Thank you for doing what you did. Thank you for being here today. Thank you. When we learn not to respond, but out of appreciation to say thank you, great things happen. I dare you just to thank God right now. Find something to thank God for. Thank God for helping us. Thank God for employment. Thank God for employment. Some of y'all don't get Thank God for everything he's already done because if he doesn't do anything else, he's already done more than enough. and admiration, God makes sure that things happen in the heavens. Yes, yes, yes. God is just like a good father. Yes. And I'm an I'm a average father at best. Yeah. God is a perfect father and great. When he sees you saying, God, I thank you for this beat up car. I, I, I thank you for this bus pass. I thank you for this job with this mean boss and this hard work. They refuse to give me overtime. I thank you. Because somebody doesn't have enough. You know what God does? God says, hey, hey, I, I got one down there, Charles Blue Jr. Yes, yes, they're West Mason. Yes, they're on the job right there being grateful. Send a blessing their way. God will send a blessing their way. God will send a blessing your way. I don't know, Ruth's situation was not easy. But you know that she was grateful too. Two grateful people make for a grateful relationship. Appreciation, admiration, but then notice. The text moves 
from appreciation and admiration to gentleness and generosity. To gentleness and generosity. I got in trouble last week because I said, you know, brothers, we can be like a dog in terms of vision. So I won't use the illustration like that today. But brothers tend not to be gentle. It is not in our nature to be gentle. Now, I got five kids. I got all the genders in there. Every single one of the genders in there. And uh, the brothers tend not to be gentle. I mean, when they tickle, it's like, come on, let me tickle. Let me, let me tickle. I mean, they tend not to be gentle. And, and after 14 years of marriage, my wife still reminds me of my tone, in my tenor, uh, how I talk, how I move. I was on the phone with someone who I really love. My wife was sitting next to me, and I was, I was sharing my heart. I don't think so. Huh? And she said, whoa. Whoa, who, who are you talking to like that? What's wrong with you? And I said, I, I was just. There's a tendency for brothers to be tough, to be fast, to be quick, and to hurt, to be strong. And Boaz goes against those tendencies, and he's incredibly gentle. Even when he offers himself as the kinsman redeemer, the guardian redeemer, he says, before you choose me, there is another who by right can be yours. So we ought to see if I can have you. I, I, I'm going to abdicate. I, I'm going to allow. We should see if this is meant to be. It's a gentleness that God requires of the brother. It's a gentleness that says I have such care and concern for you that I don't want to do anything that would harm or hurt you. Amen. I, don't, I don't want to even break your spirits. Brothers, brothers, married brothers, brothers who want to be married. It, it, it's a gentleness when she's at the drive through you're done with the order, you're getting ready to drive to pick up the order, and she says, oh wait, I don't think I got everything I want. Okay, you back up. She begins to look at me. Uh, uh. <laughs> Do they have dick back here? I just sit down with it. <laughs> yes. That's all. <laughs> and you want to win church, right? Right? Your response is. Just pat on the leg and drive home. <laughs> when you wake in the car, you know, instead of driving around the cul de sac one, two, beep your horn three times, don't do that. <laughs> now, 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 let me help the brethren. This is just for brothers. This is for us. Let me help the brethren. Uh, a strategy for dealing with her gently is to see how you want your daughter to be treated. Your, your daughter can wake you up, slap you around, and say, put me to sleep, Dad. And you say, okay, let's do it. Your, your daughter, you can buy this, and she wants you to buy that. You, you do all this for your daughter, and you're glad to do it. When we were in the bear shop where they make the bear for like two hours so they could make a bear for my daughter. My wife said, let's go buy her a bear. I said, no. This is Valentine's Day. She needs a special bear. Because it's your daughter. Always remember, I, 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 I'm moving, I'm moving. Always remove, remember that the woman you got is God's daughter. Yeah. The woman you got is God's daughter. And just dealing with me, I watch who looks at my daughter, my two-year-old, when I send her to a preschool kindergarten class. I just watch who's looking at her, who, who says hi to her, who gets too close to her. I say, hey, you should look close to her. <laughs> That's my daughter. Yeah. So if you, if we in our human flesh protect our daughters that way, just think how God in heaven protects his daughters on earth. He says, she's my daughter. Yeah, yeah but she, she talks too much. She's my daughter. Yeah, but she didn't do it. No, she's my daughter. That's mine. Always remember, if you want to be gentle, just remember, this is God's daughter. This is 
dot, dot. And he will help you take a walk. But, but not only is it gentleness, but it's generosity. Notice in the text, he, he protects her. He says, hey, hey, don't mess with her. He says to her, uh, continue to glean in my field. Continue to, to pick from this field right here. Then he says, you're working too hard. Please come over and drink some water. He tells the other, make sure there's stuff for her. He's always looking out and making sure that her load is light and not heavy. He's always trying to reduce the pressure on her. He says, if I got to get two jobs uh, so, so that we'll be all right, I'm going to take care of her. I, I, I want to be gentle and generous. And he gives her at every occasion. He's always giving something to her to express his love. Now, please understand, this is not about how much you have. This is about the heart you have. Because God wants us to have the heart. Another song, forgive me, but to say, I'm giving you the best that I got. And I'm going to give you any good thing I have belongs to you. That's what God wants from us. And that's what a good husband makes it. And that's the, the kind of person you want. A person who says, the best I have belongs to you. It's a matter of gentleness. It's a matter of generosity. You've been wonderful. I, I looked at this text. I'm going to read you, and then I'll teach this portion to you, because I want you to get it. It's verse 16. When Ruth came to her mother-in-law, Naomi asked, how did it go, my daughter? Then she told her everything Boaz had done for her, and added, he gave me these six measures of barley, saying, don't go back to your mother-in-law empty. Now, I read it, and I paused at empty, because the word empty there means without something in you. All right? That's what the word means there. So to say empty-handed wouldn't be the best way. That, that colloquial, that wouldn't fit there and then. Please remember that Naomi and Ruth, God daughter, were in very difficult situations. And by faith, they went back to Bethlehem, and God orchestrated this wonderful opportunity for love. When they get back, Ruth, the daughter-in-law, begins to work in a field. And God orchestrated that this field belonged to a family member, a kinsman redeemer, and she worked with all her might. God orchestrated that this kinsman redeemer saw her and said, who is that girl? God orchestrated that after all the suffering that she's been through, all the hardness, she's been married 10 years, you know, 10 years she didn't have any children, it was hard. God now says, I'm going to bless you. So here Ruth is, after having a wonderful conversation, an intimate conversation with Boaz. And Boaz sends her back to Naomi. When Naomi came to Bethlehem, she said, don't call me blessed, Naomi. Call me Mara, because I'm now bitter. She said, I came full, but I'm now empty. So now, Ruth is not just going home, she's going back to Naomi. She had been working and picking, and now she slept on a hard floor. She would have been sore. She would have been hurt, but she's going back to Naomi. She, she would have been uncomfortable. She would have been working. But before she goes back, Boaz says, I want you to take the six measures of barley back to Naomi. And he gives it to her. He says, wrap it in your garment. Fold it over in, in your garment. Whose coat is that? Let me see that coat. He, he says, I want you to take this back just like this, six measures. Now, I should tell you, six measures is a whole lot of seed. It's a whole lot of grain. And he put it in your garment. Then he said, walk this back to Naomi. All her children had died. She's walking back. Six measures. She's holding. She just said, I don't know why this food gave me so much food. <laughs> there was a lot of food to carry. Now Naomi, who lost her children, had no opportunity for future, sees Ruth off in the distance. And she says, oh my God. 
That girl walked in like she she's expecting something. She she looked like she's expecting. And, and he said, I want you to give her six measures. And now, now Naomi was desperate for something. Naomi was looking for something. And when she saw her, she said, you know what? She looks like a woman who's six months pregnant. Now, if you turn to chapter four, you'll find out that Ruth is pregnant. And now, Naomi was expecting something. So she saw in the distance what she was looking for. And all I'm trying to say, if you trust God, you serve God, you keep expecting something. Others may not see it, but because you are expecting, you'll see it. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, my, my, my wife, uh, you know I like having children. Me and my wife, I, I like having children. I, I, I would say I like having children more than my wife. And so uh, I remember the last time we were at the Cheesecake Factory, and, and my wife got her favorite dish. She ate a little bit, ate a little bit more. Oh, oh, this is terrible. Called the lady over. Uh, sir, sir, this just made me very, very sick. Something is wrong with this. I said, thank God. All right, all right, all right. Now, 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 because she's not uh, looking for something, she doesn't recognize that she's expecting something. And, and all I'm trying to say, those of us who are looking for something, we will see it before we see it. We, we, we'll see it in the distance. And, and God is good enough and gracious enough to show us some signs sometimes that, that there's some things in our future that we've been desiring and wanting and we just keep looking out, there we'll see it. Now, I don't know who this is for, but if you are looking for something, every now and then God says, I'll put a, a sign in front of you to show you that it's only a matter of time. I, I, I'll put something in your path to remind you that eyes have not seen, that ears have not heard, nor has it entered into the hearts of man the things I, I have for you. I remind you of when things were better. I, remind you of when things were great. I'll show you that I can bless you in a new kind of way. And I'm just the kind of guy, I, I'm just the kind of person that likes to expect God's blessing. I, I like to see God's blessing around the corner. I like to sense God's blessing in the distance. I like to know that God has something for me. Okay, okay, I thought that would happen. If you pay attention to science, you know that there's been a great scientific discovery that we have discovered a new planet. Oh, we have, we've discovered a new planet. But look, we have not seen the new planet because we do not have the capacity in our current telescopes to see that far. But those who are in the industry, those who are the experts, say we've discovered a new planet. The question is, how do you know you discovered a new planet? They explain, well, you know, there are some signs for every planet. There's a gravitational pull. There's some movement in the area. And I come by and say, I'm not an expert, but just in my heart, there's some signs that say God's getting ready to do something. There's some signs that say God's getting ready to bless you. There's some signs that say it's only a matter of time. There's some signs that say that in six months, I've got something for you. I've got a blessing with your name on that. I've got what you need. I've got what you pray for. I've got what you ask for. I've got a new opportunity. I've got an open door. I've got a way in. I've got a healing. I've got help. And I've got hope. I'm going to break the depression. I'm going to remake the relationship. I'm going to restore your joy. I'm going to restore your finances. I'm going to help you at a level that you did not know was going to come. I just want to give you a forewarning that it's only a matter of time. Because the truth is, She wasn't just carrying food, but she was carrying seed. And whenever you deal with seed, seed is always about the future. Seed is always about more. And seed is always about multiplication. I know I'm in the Bible because Jesus said in John chapter 12, verse 24, he said, unless a seed of corn falls to the ground and dies, it does not multiply. And he was talking about himself. He was talking about our vindication. He was talking about his resurrection. He was talking about the future and the greatest thing. All I'm trying to say is you got some seeds that you're carrying. And God is saying, I'm going to plant those seeds. And those seeds are going to be greater. Those seeds are going to be better. Those seeds are going to blow your mind. 
and it's hard for us to understand what God is going to do because God is bigger than us. But I can come by to forewarn you that God still does miracles, yeah. that God still believes in blessings, that God still does great things. I was talking to a friend named Flint, and one of the conversations was Flint had been impoverished for a long time. Flint had, Flint had been suffering for a long time. And then to have this happen to them for two years, oh, it's a terrible situation. But all the economists are saying they're going to have to pour so much money into Flint that they're going to have to revitalize their economy because they got to dig up every street and every road and put in new pipes. They're going to need flaggers. They're going to need diggers. They're going to need surveyors. They're going to need, they need a whole lot of stuff. And all I'm trying to say is no matter how bleak or dark it might look, God has a way of saying I'm going to do something new. God said, don't worry about the darkness because I like when it's real dark because then I can shine bright. God said, I'm going to break in to your circumstances. Stand to our feet. The gospel has increased.